the really important thing that can be done with psychedelics in a generalized sense is that they are uh, inspiration for ideas and that when you sail out into the psychedelic dimension you're sailing out onto an ocean of ideas and you can lower your nets and you know there are many minnows and few whales but the goal is to bring up something middle-sized that is both astonishing but non-lethal that, that you can wrestle into your intellectual life and so over the years especially since 1971 I have been sort of the victim of an obsessive idea that I have developed to great lengths and the inspiration for this idea is all this time spent in the psychedelic dimension nevertheless I wouldn't have to say that I could just claim to be a kind of incipient or uh, you know, idiot savant who had dreamed up this thing. But I tell you, it springs from an attempt to understand the psychedelic vision. Um, generally, the idea is this. It hypothesizes a quality to reality that science has never recognized or discussed. And the quality is called novelty. And novelty is something which knits the world together and creates new emergent properties out of the densification of uh, previous states of existence. Novelty is the force which caused stars to condense out of a primal cloud of energy caused planets or this planet to evolve life, caused life to leave the oceans, caused humanity to emerge out of animal organization, cult high culture out of previous culture, so forth and so on. And it's a morally neutral force. It isn't good. It isn't bad. It just is a tendency in the universe to conserve complexity and to build ever more complex phenomena by incorporating uh, uh, lower levels of complexity into higher levels of organization. And this is how biology works and it's how the physical sciences work. And I noticed that if you think about the career of novelty as the life of the universe and you see you know, the primal explosion its condensation into the primitive galaxies, uh, the condens at lower and lower temperatures, what is happening is more and more complex phenomena become possible because at very high temperatures, atomic particles can't even settle in uh, to stable orbits around uh, the nucleus and form atoms then eventually atomic chemistry does become possible. At still lower temperatures, the molecular bond can form and life can emerge. And then within the regime of temperatures and pressures that life operates, complexity proliferates very rapidly and, uh, and uh, always conserving itself, always building on the previous levels. So I thought that this was very interesting and that it could be mathematically modeled. Uh, I noticed that each threshold into deeper novelty takes place ever more rapidly. So that novelty in the career of novelty in the world can be said to be speeding up. And this, I take 20th century culture then to be not epiphenomenal but proof of this theorem that the world is getting spun the, uh, at a higher and higher rate, that novel phenomena, novel effects are proliferating ever more rapidly. Okay, well, so that's the general notion. Well, you know, a fantasy about what, could, how could we, can we imagine any way to save the world? And just without regard to the rules of reason, particularly. 
an obvious solution is why not make everybody an inch and a half high? And this apparently utterly ludicrous idea uh, can be pursued slightly <laughs> further because the creatures in the DMT place are small. That's the main, one of the main features about them. They're small, and when we talked about them, we said it would be parsimonious to suppose that they might be from the future. Well, is it possible that uh, the destiny of the human race is to become an extremely diminutive species that lives in a solid state matrix inside hills? And that this is where we're going. We're just going into the mountains, sinking away from the surface into the kind of solid state crystalline matrix that we know the earth to be. I mean, I, I don't have a lot attached to this. I, it's sort of charming, sort of bananas. I mean, uh, but the weird feeling of recognition and wonderment that you have in the presence of these DMT creatures may mean that they are a future state of humanity. And this peculiar aura that goes with the experience where you can tell you're underground, you're way, way underground, it's a, it's a gnome, a gnomic existence. And these jeweled machines and toys which they offer you, the mythology of gnomes is that they are master tinkerers. Uh, you know, they build wonderful objects. So, you know, maybe when the world really becomes alarmed, all kinds of possibilities uh, can be found for a sane human future. This is a maybe a good thing to leave you with or to talk about in the final uh, meeting. You know, we generally pretty much strive for agreement, but there are certain key points where I haven't seen how you can have it both ways. And one is this whole issue of artificiality versus the natural world. How can we imagine a future that both honors the human world and the natural world when there are so many of us? I mean, uh, turning everybody into the size of a fruit fly is one possibility, but uh, we don't haven't been making a lot of progress along this line of research uh, recently. So it doesn't look like it's a near-term thing. Well, then the more sophisticated version of that is, can the human intellect be downloaded into circuitry? Can we somehow have a, an existence that we would recognize as an existence without a body? And do we want that? And what is that like? And what does it say about our souls if we choose that? Uh, you know, these are pretty strange questions. Uh, what is human nature in the absolute absence of nature? You know, a very interesting fantasy that you can undertake as a lifetime project, I do this all the time, is to imagine what you would make the world be like if it could be any way you wanted. And, you know, in the first half hour of exercising this fantasy, you realize that every, all our imaginings are conditioned by the constraints of matter. I mean, so you start out and you say, well, if the world could, if I could have anything, oh, I don't know, I guess I'd live in the Frank Lloyd Wright waterfall house and have my Testa Rosa parked outside. And then you realize, you know, that this is a stupid fantasy <laughs> and that you could live in the Leningrad library if you wanted and have your space shuttle parked outside. <laughs> and then you realize that's a stupid fantasy. And, you, and, and then you realize, you know, that, that there are no limits, that if mind were not constrained by the rules of physics, we don't know what we are. We don't know the castles that we would build in the air. One of the interesting things about virtual reality is the idea that we're going to be able to wander among the three-dimensional constructions of the imagination with no concern whatsoever for cost-effective use of materials. 
because materials are electrons and light and computer commands. It costs no more to have a, a, a gothic cathedral than to have a stucco duplex. So, you know, it's... Uh, uh, well, I think that the future of humanity must be in the imagination. That somehow we, the imagination is a place. It's a world. It's a straw being extended by the overmind to a drowning person. And we have to somehow marshal our wherewithal to march off into the imagination because it's the only safe haven there is. What we are cannot be unleashed on the surface of a planet without destroying that planet. I mean, we've only possessed serious technology for a hundred years. You know, before that, nobody had nothing. I mean, it was a big chore to melt metal and stuff like that. The big guns of being able to push matter and energy around on any significant scale have only been in our hands since 1945. And look, the planet is a complete mess. So uh, if we envision an existence of hundreds of years and any kind of future for ourselves, we're going to have to make some, some major choices. Are we the stewards of the earth to become kind of togged gardeners of a world reborn? Or are we, is it our Viking plunder genes? Do we want to build starships the size of Rhode Island and set out for Alpha Centura with plans to strike deeper into the nearby galaxy? What is it going to be? Or are these fantasies based on driving the future car using only the rear view mirror? Are there sideways options? What about these elf fairy other dimensions. How seriously can we take that? Uh, what about getting into the imagination through a kind of perfection of yoga? Can all these things that have always been reserved for beady-eyed holy people be democratized so they have impact in everybody's everyday life? Is that a possibility? Um, you know, what has to happen is an abandonment of the idea that only certain classes of solutions will be considered. Like currently in the world, the only class of solutions that can be considered for any problem are solutions which make a buck. That's the main idea. And I already hear that the defense industrial complex is going to transform itself into the industrial detoxification complex. And they will just take those huge military budgets and uh, use all that money now to clean up the mess they made creating the weapons that now have to be destroyed in order to make a sane world. Is this nutty or what? I mean, it's like putting Nazis in charge of a Jewish resettlement program. You <laughs> can't understand the thinking at all, you know? So... You know, the bad news for people who like to just roll a bomber and put their feet up, which I certainly number myself among them, <laughs> is that, you know, there's political shit to be shoveled uh, because, and it's mostly informational. It's mostly public relations. This is why, in a way, there's hope because, you know, uh, you may be the general of the Grand Army, you may have your finger on the thermonuclear button, but you can't get respect at the breakfast table. This is a universal phenomenon. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I'm sure Stalin had to hear terrible things at the breakfast table from his children, you know. And every other dominator is in this position. There's no peace because, you know, you have to have women around to bear you children, and then half of these children are women, and there's just no escape from it. So, uh... You just lost a groupie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is the great principle which makes change possible, that information travels everywhere. And the best ideas will win. 
if we can level the ideological playing field as the stakes are raised higher and higher more and more desperate options will be considered and eventually they will even come to such mad fringes as ourselves and say you know well everything else has failed what do you people have in mind yeah it seems to me that one of the things that's happening or happening more frequently is that when a mass of people change their mind, is what's happening in Europe right now, that, ma- that major changes just happen you know, like overnight. And that that's one of the things that can be happening, that the mind itself changes sufficiently so that it's a quantum. A switch over. Yes, well, one of the most interesting things that I think is going on in the world with all this stuff in Eastern Europe and China and so forth and so on that's not been commented upon very much, and you can see why when I comment on it. Um, All of these changes are driven by huge crowds, massive crowds. Never in history have rulers had to face crowds of a million people standing in the center square of the city screaming, resign, resign. Eric Honecker, the, when the notes came out of the East German Politburo meeting, he was all for turning the army loose on these people. And the, the Krenz and the people around him said, Eric, you can't beat up 400,000 people. There's no way to do it. And, uh, you know, somebody said you need 100,000 people to wag the tail of the Bolshevik dog. You need half a million people to kick the Bolshevik dog out of the house. And there are more do- more than Bolshevik dogs needing to be moved around. I think that this perestroika thing is totally unwelcome in the Western democracies because we're running a skin game. I mean, we could use free elections. Free, uh, free elections are when you don't have federal subsidies for parties which have to have millions of members to qualify. Uh, uh, we could use a renunciation of the leading role of the Republico Democratisti party, which has ruled this country for 200 years with an iron hand. I mean, all of this openness needs to come here. Our premises, uh, we just live in an illusion. You know, when you think about the, what's happening with re, uh, reproductive freedom and the notion that we're considering turning half the population into second-class citizens who could be forced by law to face a life-threatening experience that they're not interested in, I mean, this kind of thinking is very bizarre. Uh, thinking about the future and what the challenges will be and where people like ourselves are going to have to stand in all this, uh, I think that the great stumbling block now in the formation of a sane global agenda is uh, religious fundamentalism. And all three of the monotheistic religions are just guilty, guilty, guilty of this malarkey. I mean, Islamic fundamentalism is going to make enormous gains in the next little while. I see the resonance to the gains of Islam that we looked at last night coming in the fact that if you combine Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Azerbaijan into one country, it will be the world's largest Muslim country. It's almost twice the size of Iran. This is coming as the Soviet Union twists apart. The Islam is going to be the major real estate windfall is going to go in their direction. Uh, uh, Zionist fundamentalism in the Middle East is making it impossible to get a solution there in a situation where four million people are arrayed against 500 million people from a historical perspective, this is not, a, you know, it's a, it's a potential earthquake in the historical continuum. And, uh, and Christian fundamentalism has completely distorted the social agenda in this country, uh, not only on the issue of women's rights and that sort of thing, but I believe this whole drug thing 
is a reworking of the themes of the Garden of Eden story. And that they are, you know, just so appalled at the notion, because the somewhere in that movement there must be thinkers. And they see this for exactly what it is. It's paganism. It's secular humanism. It's reconnecting to the earth by driving around the entire dominator metaphor. I mean, the peculiar thing about uh, uh, the God of the Old Testament is that of all religious ontologies on earth, this is the most male-dominated. No mother, no sister, no lover, no female offspring. I mean, yes, minor traditions if you happen to be a scholar, but the basic thing is so male. And I think the... um, you know, the attraction of monotheism is its philosophical parsimony. One God makes sense, has appeal, especially if you're into closure. But the problem is that we image in our personalities the kind of religion that we practice. And imaging ourselves as this omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing, centrally controlled entity has given a stamp of cultural approval to the ego that has left us in a very difficult position vis-a-vis the feminine, intuition, the earth, and any kind of ability to feel our situation. I mean, this kind of cultural collapse, if allowed to run to true Armageddon, is death by anesthesia. We cannot feel what is going on. I mean, the tube brings these horrendous images of, you know, pogrom and oppression and lies and toxification and wheedling and weaselness, and we can't grip the emotional levers to become alarmed. And I don't know, maybe this is good. Maybe alarm and panic have no place, that we now have to get very steely-eyed and cold as we move into uh, the real clinches of this thing. But it's in our lifetime. And there's very little talk about this. In capitalism, no planning extends beyond four or five years. In American democracy, no planning extends beyond four years. Everybody has their nose right up against it, and yet they're sailing along at a thousand miles an hour toward a brick wall that's just ahead. So, you know, planning, not necessarily, not necessarily centralized control, but planning, which is what shamanism has always been. I mean, the shaman told the people where the reindeer had moved. He told the people where the game was going to be. He told the people how they should move. He was a futurist, a forecaster, a planner. And this is what we need, this kind of intuition with integrity that isn't depending on statistical models, which are always wrong. I mean, you must have noticed everybody here who reads Time magazine or the New York Times or or the London Times, you must have noticed this weird paradox, which is you know more than most of the experts. You're better at predicting the price of gold, the movement of the stock market, the political situation in Argentina than the experts. And have you noticed on NPR when they pull together three of these guys, so-and-so, Georgetown University, Sovietologist, and they're all saying, and you say, well, these guys are, they're all right, they seem tolerable. Well, they've given their lives to understanding this stuff. And what do you care? And you're a fully empowered player when you sit down with them. In many cases, you know more than they do. It's because their intuition is totally dead. They can't make sense out of uh, the situation because their way of analyzing it is flawed. Well, somehow the grassroots good sense the common sense of ordinary people needs to be reflected. And what that means is an abandonment of ideology. Ideology is something imposed from above, and it's a filter. Then only certain solutions are allowed through. 
and uh, you know I don't I don't have a political agenda I th I praise chaos because I think the main thing working to recreate a new world is the impossibility of controlling the old world I love it when they say it's moving too fast I love it because I know it means that they cannot get a hold on it I mean can you imagine trying to be the CIA and trying to control the situation in East Germany I mean you just throw up your hands and walk away which is what we want you to do and then lo and behold it flowers according to its own dynamics right now the world is moving faster than the meddlers can meddle and uh, that's why it has this wonderfully fecund and optimistic aura to it and you know I'm amazed at the naysayers and the people who say well the instability is increasing daily in Eastern Europe nonsense it's not increasing daily I mean there have been some tight necks but uh, I, I think fundamental decisions have been made to uh, let it unravel yeah what seems to happen when political structures dissolve and well you're right about the East I mean my god the appetite for mysticism of these Russians is amazing and you know perestroikisti that I am even I recoiled when he embraced the Pope I thought <laughs> you know Kmart it's okay but the Pope <laughs> my god <laughs> Where does it end? Which I suppose shows that I'm politically constipated, you know? I mean, uh, but, uh, well, I just saw a newspaper this morning, so I've cheated on you. Uh, he who has seen the most recent newspaper <laughs> will win. Um, apparently, Shevardnadze has said it's a mess and they'll just chop off all arms shipments to everybody and everybody else should do the same and that this is the problem that all these governments are armed to the teeth and enough so I don't know Shevard Nazi the foreign minister yeah well see this is another thing that's interesting about virtual reality um, you know it costs now in California basically two hundred thousand dollars to live in the kind of home that when I was young you bought for twenty five thousand uh, dollars but in virtual reality building costs drop to zero uh, what if we could wean people away from matter I mean, what if the tackiest thing you could possibly be into would be a physical object a physical object and so people would live in white walled apartments and no paintings would hang on these walls and no knickknacks and six thousand dollar quartz crystals ripped out of Brazil and all of that stuff and yet everybody would be could be as hedonic and as stuff oriented as they wanted but none of it would be real